Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. Today in Tube Lab number 15, we're going to take a look at the E80CC, maybe the best ever 12AU7 sub. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Okay, the 12AU7 was the first of what became a large popular family of tubes, which includes the 12AT7 and the 12AX7, and many more. It was registered on October the 18th, 1946, and it was only six years later in 1952 that the E80CC was introduced by Philips. The tube is a dual triode, so two tubes in one glass envelope, and was developed as a multi-purpose tube for both computer and industrial applications, hence the 10,000 hour heater rating, plus shock and vibration ratings. And right from the beginning, it was also recommended for use in resistance coupled AF amplifiers. AF just translates to Audio Frequency Amplifier, which is what all Hi-Fi tube amps are. The E80CC is no longer being made, and vintage is the only option. Both tubes couldn't look more different. Let's have a quick look at them. This is the Philips Mini Watt SQ version, special quality, so I had gold pins. Philips also made a regular version with gold pins. And I believe the SQ tubes were just simply um, taken off the factory floor as special selector high tolerance tubes. I don't think they were built on a separate line, though they may have been. I'm not sure about that. That's commonly how it was done. Here we got a tongues ram. This is the most common, most of commonly available E80CC today, certainly as a new old stock. Uh, they had nice plated pins, and let's compare the Tungs Ram to the Philips tube. If you look at the plate front, they're almost identical. The glass envelopes are almost identical. Let's roll them over onto their side, and there's the difference. The Philips tube has two little slots, top and bottom, for ventilation of the plate, and the Tungs Ram has the slots but it's also got two large round ventilation holes as well. What else have we got? We've got this gorgeous looking Telefunken, or do we? Let's look over at the bottom. There's no embossed diamond in it. And in fact, if we compare the plates, ah, it's identical to a Tungs Ram. When I bought these, I bought a whole bunch of these New old stock, new in the box, so NOS, NIB. The seller was up front. He said these are rebranded Tungs Rams. And of course he's right. Now, does that make this a fake tube? No. Back in the day, everybody, large manufacturers, small manufacturers, retailers, they all rebranded tubes. As far as I know, Telefunk could never made an E80CC and they probably had customers that wanted it or they just wanted to keep f fill out their line with as many tubes as possible market share was a big thing back then as it is today so probably what they did was they bought in bulk from tongues ram and either had tongues ram silk screen this on but this looks so good i suspect they bought blank plates blank tubes and did the silk screen themselves in factory Take a look at the boxes. Boxes, even though they were dirty and they're a little beat up, they're lovely boxes to have. And uh, it's not surprising that they're a little beat up because they've been sitting on the shelf for decades. Anyways, these tubes tested very high with nice match sections and, of course, perfect pins. So that's, in fact, if you want a little hint as to how to know for certain if you've got a new old stock tube, Sure, you want to test it electrically, but it, take a look at the pins. Always look at the pins. If the pins are perfect like this, then you, you know 
if you've got a good tube testing electrically and the pins are perfect, that's the true new old stock. Often the boxes are lost, they fall apart, they get damaged. So it comes down to taking a look at the taking a look at the pins. Okay. Let's take a look at the difference. The 12AU7 has a maximum plate voltage of 330 volts DC, with the E80CC normally operating at a maximum of 400 volts, so a bit more, which is good. Another difference is the heater. The E80CC draws exactly twice the current as the 12AU7. At 12 volts, the 12AU7 draws a measly 150 milliamps, or 0.15 amps, and the E80CC, 300 milliamps, or 0.3 amps. Now, if you want to go from milliamps to amps, you divide by a thousand, and if you're going from amps to milliamps, you multiply by a thousand. It's important to know these things because often your spec sheets, your data sheets, are going to be listed in one or the other, but not normally in both. So you want to compare apples to apples. Gain is also different, with the 12AU7 at a nominal 17 and the E80CC at a little more at 27. One thing that is identical is the base, which is the B9A pinout, which explains why people would have felt safe trying them. Now when a base type is the same, it is much more than just another 9-pin miniature. Every electrical connection is identical. Let's just take a quick look at a sheet available on Blue Glow's website. Dave um, has a great website filled with all kinds of good tube information, and he also has an amazing series of YouTubes. If you haven't seen them, check them out. So this is the 9A right here, which is the 12AX7 and the whole series of them, including the E80CC. And he also covers all the other common tubes, the 9AJ, the 6SN7, the octal voltage amplifier that's very similar to the 12AU7, the common power tubes like the KT88, the el 34s and the common rectifier tubes as well. Now, this is really useful to look at. You can clearly see in the 9A two tube circuits, and in the case of the 9A, it can operate the heater at 6 volts or 12 volts, depending on how you set your pinouts. The 9AJ, which is also a very common 9-pin miniature, covers the 6DJ8, the 6N2P. In fact, it covers all of the common Russian 6-volt miniature 9 pins like the 6N1P, the 6N23P, and it's worth noting the difference. You can only run this tube at 6 volts on pins 4 and 5, and pin 9, rather than being the tap of the heater, is actually a shield, and that physically runs between the sections. Now, you don't have to connect pin 9 to anything, but if you want maximum shielding effect, it should go to ground. I think I've got, let me just see if I have one lying around here, handy. Here's a Russian 6N2P. You can almost call this a, a 6AX7. It's so close. It has the same gain as the 12AX7. It's a different tube in structure, but many of the parameters are very similar. And let's just find pin 9. There's pin 9 right there. You can probably see it snaking right over here to that little metal shield that divides the two sections. So it's a physical barrier that will reduce interference and noise between the sections. Okay, let's look at the main differences before you plug in one of these into a 12AU7 socket. Most important is the additional heater current. This is probably not an issue. But if it is too high for your power transformer heater winding, it may burn it out, which would ruin the transformer and be a serious bummer. What to do? 
If you have a newer commercial amp, just contact the manufacturer and ask them if it can handle the higher heater current. If it is a custom amp, take a look at the power transformer. It should have a part number and a spec sheet will give the maximum heater current that it is rated for. Then it's just a simple matter of checking the data sheet for each tube and adding them up. If your tube complement comes in lower, then you're good to go. Let's take a quick look at those data sheets. Okay, here's the 12AU7 right here. Medium MU or medium gain twin triode or dual triode. And it shows us the 6.3 volt 0.3 amp and it shows us the 12.6 volt 0.15 amps or 150 milliamps plus or minus 6%. And on data sheets, the heater voltages and currents are always first because that's what comes first with a, with a tube. If you can't light it up properly in your design or your circuit, you've got nothing. And look at this. This is the original Philips SQ data sheet for the E80CC. Now, in America, they did have a 6085 version, and I've never actually seen one, so I don't think they're that common. Look at the date at the bottom, 6-6-1957. It's in two languages, because of course Philips, even though it was an inter international electronics giant, um, it was a Dutch-based company. So here we've got the 6.3 volt, 0.6 amps, or 600 milliamps, and at 12.6 volts we've got 0.3 amps, or 300 milliamps. Data sheets really rock. They're easy to find with a simple Google search. Okay. Last, we have the higher gain. Not much, but if the next stage is not designed to handle it, it might overload that stage. I discovered that the driver tubes in my custom monoblocks had problems using the lower rated 6SN7 GTs. But the higher rated GTA and Bs had no problem. Overloading the next stage a wee bit probably won't damage anything. Just send the receiving tube into overload. Try it. If it sounds good for a wee while, it'll be fine. It took some time for my GTs to decide they didn't like being driven that hard. So I shut down and tried a GTB and all was good. Okay, enough data and history. What in the heck? Do the E80CC sound like? Well, in short, brilliant. But let's look at each tube in detail. Up first is the tongues round version. Bass was good plus, with very good tone, well defined and neutral. Mid bass was particularly nice. Mid bass is the upper end of the base frequencies and the very lower end of the mid-range, roughly 200 to 400 hertz, or cycles as he used to say in the old days. Mid-range was very nice, clean, clear, and crisp, or what I note as the three C's, and that means it was detailed as well as conveying that warm tube mid-range many of us love. Treble was very nice, basically carrying on where the mid-range leaves off. This is pretty common in preamp tubes that I review. If the mid-range is displaying nice clarity, the treble almost always is good as well. What makes the tube shine is the level of detail, clarity, and dynamics. And on top of that, the sound stage was all there. I find tubes with these sorts of characteristics tend to present a nice sound stage. Muddy or overly tuby presentations without nice detail just lose that sound stage. Next, we've got the Philips E80CC SQ Gold Pin. And how did they sound? Well, the bass was good plus. Nice tone and slightly forward. Mid-range was very nice, and according to my listening notes, 
close to live. You'll almost never hear me say that. Treble exhibited the three C's nicely, clean, clear, and crisp, with nice sparkle on top. In summary, these are probably the best of the best E80 CC type ever made. How much better than the Tung Shram? Well, they edged the Tung Shrams out in both base and mid-range, slightly. However, both tubes are about equal in the treble range. The difference isn't very big. And given that a nice balanced, high testing SQ can easily sell for $100, and a similar testing Tungs Ram for half that, I consider the Tungs Ram to be a good alternate to the hard to find and very expensive Phillips tubes. So I'm going to award the Tungs Ram a Best Buy. Now one thing to keep in mind is that the E80CC isn't necessarily going to be better or even a good choice in every amp. And obviously if you have a 12AU7 used as a phase inverter, it is probably a waste of money subbing for the much more expensive tube. Now let me tell you a fun story that explains my excitement about this tube. I normally work in the tube lab in silence better to concentrate. But that day I had a quick job to do, so I left the music playing next door, and while I was working I stopped and started listening to a wee bit of a drum solo. And damn, if it didn't sound live! I couldn't believe a band wasn't playing in my living room. I stopped, and I went back to the listening area. These tubes are that good. Okay, let's take a quick look at what came in over the holidays. I made a little preview for 2021 video that came out a few days ago talking about some of the tubes. Let's just clear the deck. Got about 25 of these really nice shiny black plate 12AU7s in. They were sold as organ grade tubes from one of my wholesalers. And they came in very clean, nothing on them. And I suspected that it might be a Raytheon. Raytheon often has this shiny black coated uh, plate. And um, I, uh, I have a bunch of Raytheon 12AU7s and I couldn't match them up. So I looked at every one of them and finally I found one that had a little bit of print left that said Baldwin organ. So good. I, I now know for sure that they're organ grade tubes, which normally means they're selected for low noise. And there was a couple of little numbers on top. And alleluia, one of them was the manufacturing code for Raytheon. So now I, I know I've got, I really have a real Raytheon. And these tubes tested really high with fairly good balance. And given the age of these tubes, that's a bit unusual. What else came in? Oh, literally a thousand Russian tubes easily came in. I'm working on a prototype phono preamp that uses the Russian tubes, namely the 6N2P, though I'm experimenting with other Russian tubes. And the reason I'm doing that is I wanted to try a new preamp design, and I also wanted to try a tube that's not the 12AX7. And the reason for that is nice testing, balanced, quiet, good sounding 12AX7s have become incredibly expensive and hard to find. And of course, for most phono stages, you need at least a pair of them matched. So that's why I'm I'm working around with the Russian tubes. They're they're sounding really good, um, they're testing good, and they're, best of all, they're very affordable. So, we've got a lot of those in stock, and are coming into the inventory. Now, the other thing that I've been looking for for a long time is a 6-volt switch mode power supply. The 12 volts are very easy to find. But a 6 volt isn't. Now, the thing with the, the SMPSs is these power supplies um, tend to be noisy. Uh, a year and a half ago or so, 
I had about 25 different 12 volt units in and I tested them all on the scope and almost all of them are noisy. A lot of spiky, spiky artifacts left over from switching from AC to DC. Now a handful of them were very quiet and superb units and those tended to be the name brands like Toshiba and Sony. The off brands, they most of them were, were not good to work with. So I've been looking for a long time for something to run 6 volt filaments off of. I like to, in my preamp designs and builds, I like to run the filaments with independent power supply at DC. It tends to keep the noise level down if you have a quiet power supply. And these are really sweet. You take a look at them. They're universal. So they'll take an input of 100 to 240 volts AC with an output of 7 volts DC at 2.14 amps. And it's really tough to find the small 6 and 7 volt um, power supplies at more than 1 and a bit amps. So that's just perfect. It didn't come with an IEC cord, so you just use um, a cord for your own country's um, power system. So that was a really nice find. Well, that was fun. And if you stayed all the way till the end, here's some discount codes for you. And I do flat rate shipping of $20 globally. And if you have a $150 order or more after discount, the shipping's on me. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.